Lots of boys and girls are going down. Um, just want to thank our boys and girls, thank the choir and orchestra and musicians um, for all the hard work that you put into this night. And um, here we are to celebrate the ascension of Christ. It's one of those um, events, of course, as we think about 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus returned to heaven. It, it was a going away, right? So sometimes we might wonder, why would we celebrate the ascension? Why would we celebrate the going away of Jesus? And particularly on a day like today, where we talked about it this morning in worship, and Nathan mentioned it already this evening, you can't help escape some of the deep, deep losses that the church has experienced in the last few days, particularly the PCA, and maybe even in the broad, broader evangelical world. Maybe you come tonight with some of your own discouragement, some of your own sufferings. Uh, sometimes we live, don't we, with a sense of dread about what's coming. We, we know something's happening this week. Maybe it's at work or at home. And I want to ask you the question tonight, why should we rejoice in the ascension of Christ in the middle of all of those kind of things that happen in our life? Sometimes we reduce the ascension simply to this, that we think about it as simply a change of venue, right? Christ was here, now he's there. That, that's all the ascension is about. But one of the Reformed confessions says, no, 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 it's, a, it's, it's about a lot more than that. That in fact, the ascension of Christ, Christ going to heaven, he is there for our benefit. So let me give you three very, very brief reasons why we should rejoice in the ascension of Christ. Here's the first. The ascension of Christ proclaims to us that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Where is he today? Well, we know he's in heaven, but more specifically, where is Christ today? And the answer the scriptures give us is this, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. This is what he told his disciples, Luke twenty two sixty nine. 69. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Or as Paul reminds us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, if you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He's not just in heaven. Christ didn't just ascend to heaven, but he ascended to be seated at God's right hand. In the Bible, when it thinks about the right hand, sorry for you lefties, <laughs> the right hand is, is the hand of power. It's the hand of authority. We even think about it that, sometime, that way sometimes, don't we? When we say, um, Hutch, he is my right hand man. That means that, you know, Hutch has authority given to him to do things. For Jesus to be seated at the right hand of the Father simply means this, that he is seated in a place of power and authority and rule and reign. In other words, he is Lord. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And on days like this or weekends like this when we think about some of the heaviness that the church has experienced, even our own congregation. Don't we need to know that the throne is not empty, but it's occupied? Occupied by the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you need to know that whatever it is that you're facing this week, the throne is not empty. Jesus is Lord. He is the sovereign king. He is Lord of all. And the ascension reminds us of that. Second thing the ascension does is that the ascension of Christ to God's right hand reminds us that our salvation is secure. Not only do we believe that Jesus is at God's right hand, but in fact, we confess this, that Jesus is sitting at God's right hand. He is seated at the right hand of God. Hebrews 10, 11 and 12 reminds us of this. It says, every priest, talking about the Old Testament priests, every priest stands daily 
at the service of God, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at God's right hand. He is not standing like the Old Testament priest who kept repeating sacrifices over and over and over again. They kept standing because there was always work to do. But when Christ offered the single sacrifice once for all through the shedding of his blood, the Bible says he sat down. It's what you do at the end of a day, isn't it? When all of your work is finished, all of your tasks, all of your errands completed, there's nothing else to do. What do you do at the end of the day? You sit down. And it's a way of saying everything I needed to do is finished. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, ascended to heaven, now seated at God's right hand. Why? Because our salvation is finished. It is accomplished. There is nothing more for our great heavenly high priest to do. Yes, he keeps interceding, but nothing to do to accomplish our salvation or his atoning work on our behalf. The death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, they have accomplished what is needed to do. And now that those are done, Christ ascends to heaven and he sits down. You ever wonder sometimes if there's any unfinished business? You know, sometimes we wonder about our salvation. We lack assurance and things. Is there more to do? Is there more to do? And just remember this. Where is Christ? He is the ascended Lord who is sitting. It's all finished. It's all accomplished for you. This is what the resurrection of Christ reminds us of, or the ascension of Christ reminds us of. And then let me give you a third. The ascension of Jesus proclaims that our future is guaranteed. The ascension of Christ proclaims that our future is guaranteed. Christ has ascended bodily. It wasn't a ghost that went up before the disciples. They were able to see him. And Jesus says, just as you saw me go into heaven, so I'm going to return. He ascended bodily. Our flesh and our blood is in heaven. Christ is there. The scarred hands of Christ are there. And friends, that is a pledge that he is going to take us to heaven. His own bodily ascension is a pledge that he's going to come and take us to be there with him. Jesus, in these very familiar words out of John chapter 14, says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself that you also may be where I am. If I go away and I prepare this place, I'm going to come back and you're going to be there with me. It's a guarantee, you see, of our future. Our future of not only um, life after death, but a bodily resurrection and reigning with Christ in glory, just as he's in glory now, forever and ever and ever. So, you know, even on a heavy weekend like this, the ascension, the, the ascension of Christ says something to us. Harry Reader is with Christ. Tim Keller is with Christ. If you trust in Jesus, you are going to be with Christ. And one day, with a body that is resurrected, made new, made whole. It reminds me of stories I used to hear um, Sometimes in my last church, which um, wasn't, it wasn't an immigrant church, but there were a couple of generations before where immigrants had come from Europe and settled in the States. But people would tell stories about their ancestors having come across the ocean. And often what would happen is the dad would say to the family, he said, I'm going to go on ahead of you. I'm, I'm going to go over to the new country and I'm going to get a job and get us a home and establish everything for us, make, make it all ready. 
And then I'm going to come back. And I'm going to take all of you to be there with me. Jesus has gone into glory. Our flesh and blood is there. A guarantee that we too, our flesh and blood, will be there one day. And so, what we're doing tonight is wonderfully right. That we gather to praise God for the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just join together and pray. Thank God for that. Father in heaven, we do praise you for the ascension of Jesus. We praise you that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is reigning. The throne is not empty. It is occupied by our Lord Jesus. We're grateful that our salvation is secure as he sits at God's right hand now. And then we think about what is coming, that our future is guaranteed, a bodily resurrection and a reign with Christ in glory, that heaven indeed will be our home. And so, Father, we pray that you encourage us with these truths and help us to rejoice in them. In Jesus' name.